Today's talk is entitled, The Mystery of Sophia. This is one of my favorite topics. I've been studying this, I, can, I think, all of my life, because when I had heard about a male god, something didn't sit right with me, to be quite frank with you. When I looked at the Mary mysteries in the Catholic Church, and I, I knew that they worked, I could see that they worked, it just made me study more and more and more. So over time, I had come up with many, many ideas and had studied many different philosophies and theologies concerning Sophia, and I could not come to an answer uh, or a conclusion until I came across Rudolf Steiner. And even then, Rudolf Steiner in his time said that the mysteries of Sophia could not yet be revealed, that they were the mysteries of what he calls the sixth epoch, and that those mysteries should be held back except for literally those who have a female, the eternal female inside of them, who could receive these mysteries with the proper reverence, devotion, and awe that would be necessary to truly embody what is being said in the mysteries of Sophia as revealed through Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy. As you probably know, since this is an advanced lesson, you probably listened to the tape that was on the threefold goddess. And we made all kinds of justifications for why there was such a being. But today we'd like to go much, much further than that. And we'd like to demonstrate how Sophia is literally the limit of your imagination. By that I mean the limits of your imagination or the limits of Sophia that you will be able to perceive or understand. Especially if, as neo-anthroposophists, we take the work of Rudolf Steiner as a foundation. Because if that's the case, then we know that he tells us that there is a being whose name is Anthroposophia, who, is, who knocks at our heart and asks to come into us, finds out about our spiritual development, takes it out and makes it objective in front of us, and then helps us in our spiritual growth. Now, that is more than anybody else, including Jakob Burma or any other sociologist, the Russian sociologist, or anyone I know of, has ever said to describe who this being is, this being of Anthroposophia. In the Gospel of Sophia, as you know, there's the historical development of that being of Anthroposophia, from who we knew as Isis, to Theosophia, to Sophia, to Phil Philosophia, to Anthroposophia. This is an evolving being who came down to Earth all, as a human, but without a human body, who ages 100 years for every, her one year is 100 years to us, and she is actually advancing there in front of us. And so we have the mystery of Sophia as Anthroposophia given to us through Rudolf Steiner that is uh, somewhat of a shock. Because when you look at it, it is completely self-evident that the riddles of philosophy, as he gave them in his book, called The Riddles of Philosophy, as you look at the philosophers down through history, you can clearly see the evolving being that came along with humanity as the nursemaid of humanity's intellectual and spiritual development. That is very simple to see. That is a mystery of Sophia that no one else has ever given besides Rudolf Steiner. So if you just take that alone, that could be a mystery that we could dwell on and have a conversation about for a very great period of time. But there are other mysteries. For instance, as you look at the sophiologists, and, uh, whether they're Russian or whether they're the Jane Lead or w all the different sophiologists, the, uh, even the Moravian Brotherhood, the Unity Brethren, the uh, uh, Brothers of Philosophy, all, all these different people had a view of Sophia that was profound, but it was a gigantic view. And it just didn't come up with enough pieces to ask simple questions as the following. In almost all cases that I know of, she is referred to as a mirror, that she reflects God, that she's the epiphany of God, she's the manifestation of God. Well, let me ask the question of anyone who would say that. If she was the reflection of a God who's a trinity, why isn't she a trinity? That's self-evident. She would have to be a trinity. She is a holographic representation of her consort. There is a mother God for the father God. There is a daughter God, goddess, mother goddess, daughter goddess, and holy Sophia, just as there is a father God, son God, and Holy Spirit. And they work together. So when you see the discussions that lead to say that Sophia is the Holy Spirit, or Sophia is the female of Christ, or Sophia is the manifest and God is the unmanifest, or that she's the mirror 
Well, every time I hear Sophia put into a passive, instead of an active condition during creation, I know that it's probably not accurate. We know from Rudolf Steiner that there is a mother god. He just never said it quite in the terms that there was a mother god, daughter god, Anthroposophia. But he clearly described the daughter god, who we know as the Kyriotetes, which we'll come back to in a moment. And he clearly described Anthroposophia, the being I just mentioned. So who is the mother god according to Rudolf Steiner? He says that what are known as the mothers that is an ancient, ancient tradition that Faust picked up on, uh, that uh, Goethe picked up on in his Faust. When he makes reference to the mothers, and Faust gives really clear descriptions of exactly what happens when you enter into these mothers, the most mysterious of all of the mystery initiation knowledge is to whisper the name, the mothers. Because for some reason it invokes in whoever mentions the name, such awe and reverence that they don't know how to handle the creative burgeoning life forces that come out of this being because this being seems to be the leaven of all creation. Rudolf Steiner says that the mothers are the hierarchies that were used to create ancient Saturn, ancient Sun, ancient Moon. And then as we know in our incarnation of the Earth, the Christ as a as the Elohim or the combined forces of the seven Elohim brought the form of the human being. But Saturn, Sun, Moon, in other words, all of the hierarchy, all nine hierarchy that it took to create the minerals, the plants, and the animals for us to use, that is the mothers. And Steiner talks about when you go back to try to perceive what these mothers are, what happens to you, and it's actually quite terrifying. The further back you go, the more you're going to experience. For instance, as you go back to just experience the moon, what are you going to experience? You're going to experience fear, doubt, and hatred in the moon, sun, and ancient Saturn existence. Because what you face at the end is the annihilation of your own being as you wish to go back to see what happened in those ancient times and to attempt to experience them in the Akashic Records. You can do it but you have to work with the mothers. And as you do, you will face the demons, your own doubles, that will arise as you go into the astral, etheric, and physical world, because that's what the mothers are. So you have then the past, all created by the being of the mothers. Rudolf Steiner once made the remark that if you took the sounding of all nine hierarchies, it would make the sound of suffering. And if you were to give it a name, that name would be the great goddess, the mother of all. So we have the combined hierarchy as the mother. According to Rudolf Steiner, the three ranks of the hierarchy are ruled by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he actually said that the combined work of all nine hierarchy, in other words, all that manifested in our universe is the work of the nine hierarchy, and that is the mother's. He said that those mothers became what was known as Mater Doloroso, which means the mother of suffering. And that's where the concept suffering from the nine hierarchy comes. The nine hierarchy suffer us to come into existence. And that's why at the Christmas season, and we think about the Madonna and Mary and the dark womb of the winter night that brings to birth the light of the spring, that's happening in all of us. This is the gift of the mothers to us right now. We are like the daughter, and we're trying to move towards being the Holy Sophia or like the Holy Spirit. So we have the gift of the mother and the father. The mysteries of the father we've discussed before. The father is unmanifest. The mother is manifest. And then there's a trinity, as we know, of mother, daughter, Holy Sophia. And this mother being was there at creation, but then so was the daughter. And so was Holy Sophia. Just as the trinity of the male, there was a trinity of the female that was co-equal and worked together. This answers all of the speculation of the sophiologists who say that there are syzygies, these magical workings of uh, opposite forces of male and female working together. That is exactly right. Mother and father are a syzygy. Son and daughter are a syzygy. And Holy Spirit and Holy Sophia are a syzygy. They work together. And as they work together, they manifest creation. 
We can go into further elucidation of this, which is coming out in a paper soon, on this question of the mystery of Sophia, which will be showing how not only do you find that threefold configuration in the human spiritual nature, for instance, Rudolf Steiner says there are three parts to the spirit. Spirit self, life spirit, spirit man. Spirit self is the Holy Spirit. Life spirit is worked through and is controlled and donated to by Christ. And the spirit man is through the Father. Well, at the same time, he says that once you perfect the soul, and we'll go over that in a moment, because you have to go through the realms of Mary Magdalene, Mary of Cleophas, to the mother of Jesus, the Virgin Sophia, that's the threefold soul, which he also has names for. But you can find in the spiritual part of the human being, the Holy Sophia, the daughter, and the mother in the threefold spirit aspects of the human being that coincide with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the spirit realm, we know that there's a trinity that is co-equal to the male. In the soul realm, we have something quite extraordinary. We have Rudolf Steiner saying that the soul is threefold, of course, as we know. The sentient soul, which deals, was, was first developed, and those are the forces of your desires that worked with your astral body. Then there's the intellectual soul, where your thinking actually came to birth as an objective thinker. And then there's the consciousness soul, the time that we're in now. Each of those, actually, we have to go through in a chronological order. We must first conquer the sentient soul. That is the Mary Magdalene aspect of the soul. That is the soul that went through the passion of Christ, that loved Christ, that washed Christ's feet with her tears and her hair. This was a mystery initiation that she was going through in a perfection of herself, which was very evident as you look at the story of Mary Magdalene through the gospel. She is where most of us are, and most of us will certainly start, which is in the sentient soul trying to control our passions, trying to control our desires, take our desires from personal love and passion and sex to spiritual love, to the love of enlightenment for all, the sake of all sentient beings. This is the Mary Magdalene who's transformed. And she does give birth to a child. And so the mythologies today of Mary Magdalene and Christ being married, well, in a way, that's true for each and every one of us at this moment. We are supposed to have Christ's child, but the way we do that is that's the birth of the intellectual soul. That's the birth of thinking, what we called in a previous talk the Akashic ether, the thought ether. When we have its birth in the intellectual soul, that is Mary Magdalene giving birth. It's Mary of Cleophas, who is the sister of the one called the Mother of Christ, who is also always called Sophia or in the Mystery Initiation Center, is the Virgin Sophia. So Mary, the sister of the mother of Jesus, Mary Cleophas, sometimes is confused with Mary, the sister of Martha. And it's okay, because they both have great instructive lessons for us. But according to Rudolf Steiner, Mary of Cleophas is the representation of the soul that objectively experiences Christ's passion and is there really speechless but awake. And this is Mary of Cleophas always giving support to her sister. The third Mary is a threefold Mary in herself, a mystery that we only slightly delved into last time we spoke. But this is the daughter of the Trinity, the Divine Feminine Trinity. She comes from the realm of the Kyriotides, who are the beings of wisdom, two ranks above where Christ worked. There were the being of Sophia came into the rank of the Kyriotides from her own trinity. And from there she came down all the way to overlight Mary, who was the stepmother of Jesus that we know of. There were two Jesuses and two Marys. Only two, only two of them remained, of course, one Jesus, one Mary. That was Jesus and his stepmother. That stepmother had the other mother who had passed away come and overlight her already, and it entered her soul. But at the moment of the baptism of Christ in the Jordan, the being of the Kyriotides had came, come all the way down through the ranks of the hierarchy, seven realms, and came into that being who was called the mother of Jesus, and at that moment 
she became completely virgin. In other words, she went back to Eve before the fall in the garden. And the great secret of this is that that person called Mary, usually, or the mother of Jesus, is in fact Eve reincarnated. So when in the intellectual soul, Mary of Cleophas gives birth to the objective thinking, this is only after the Mary Magdalene soul in us has worked through our passions. And then, once we have gone through witnessing Christ, who Christ is, which is what Mary, the mother of Jesus, went through. She was the only one who fully comprehended who the Christ was. She had the wisdom of the Christ because the Kyriotetes, the beings of wisdom, came all the way down, entered into her body, and made her a virgin soul. In other words, redeemed what was called the fall from Eden because that Eve was the very Eve that was part of the fall from Eden. And when this other Mary merged with her and when the Kyriotetes merged with her, she became the greatest representation of a bodhisattva, a human being rising up into the spirit through ascension that meets an avatar being coming down and together that being became an avatar and a bodhisattva at the same time. And for 11 years, she stayed in that body and taught the wisdom of Christ through John the Beloved, who Christ under the cross said, this is your mother and this is your son, and united the two of them together so that the wisdom of this mother of Jesus called the Virgin Sophia would be able to be taught to humanity through the Gospels of John and particularly through the Apocalypse of John because John stayed with Mary until the end of her life when she was then assumed into heaven. And so we have in the soul this picture that from the intellectual to the consciousness soul we must go through the suffering of Christ. We must understand Christ's death and resurrection, birth, death, and resurrection because that is the mystery of the Virgin Sophia. That is the mystery of the Mother of Christ. All traditions have said that preparing the soul is preparing the Virgin Sophia for the wedding. That wedding is to the Holy Spirit. And so, when we ourselves become the Virgin Sophia, we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit and it comes pouring into us as a gift from Christ who is even above that, what we in Anthroposophy call monastic and Buddhic principles or spirit self and life spirit, they come pouring into the Virgin Sophia. And we can see there what Rudolf Steiner says in the study of man then, that the spirit and the soul wish to come into the etheric and the astral. So what we have is in the physical, we have Mary of the past, the three mothers. What we have in the uh, astral are the three Marys of Mary Magdalene, Mary of Cleophas and the Virgin Sophia, and what we have in the spirit are the, th the divine feminine trinity, the Holy Sophia, or Anthropos Sophia, as Rudolf Steiner called her, and then the daughter goddess and the mother god. So we have here this deep, deep mystery that even in the ninefold constitution of the human being, we can find at every single level Sophia. We find her at every level of the trinity. We find her in the soul, the spirit, in the physical. We find her everywhere you look. And so when we say the mystery of Sophia, what we really should be saying is the demystifying of Sophia. Rudolf Steiner said that the ancient wisdom of Isis had to be killed, had to be taken beyond the stars and hidden. And then now, only now, do we then bring back that wisdom. We have to resurrect Isis, not in an old fashion, but in a new fashion to add the type of wisdom that we're speaking about here today, that you find Sophia in all of her many different names throughout every aspect of the human being. There is this debate that there is no trinity, that there is only a duality of a heavenly Sophia and an earthly Sophia. This, of course, would make no sense. You can see all the questions of all the theorists, because in many of these cases, the reason that they got it wrong is because they were theories. They did not look directly into the human being and say, where do I find the Sophia in myself? Because this is the being 
who brought the Christ to birth. Our job is to bring the Christ to birth, but it always takes a vessel to hold. It takes a grail to hold the gifts and the grail that are being given out. It takes the Sophia of Christ. It takes the wisdom of Christ. So as we look at the mystery of Sophia, we can see that the mother, the daughter, and the holy Sophia can be found in all aspects of the human being. And that as we delve into any aspect of anthroposophy, neo-anthroposophy that we wish to, if you look close, you will find Sophia looking back at you.